In the early days of the space shuttle program, or even before there was one, U.S. scientists continually delved into uncharted territory, with many inquiries soon arising. While NASA was able to take a spacecraft into the atmosphere, it soon became evident that the real test was to bring it back down in one piece. But for all the knowledge that military developers had acquired about aviation, the space frontier still posed an unprecedented challenge. That is, until an engineer from the Flight Research Center unearthed the concept from many decades before. If the wings were a problem for a spacecraft re-entering the Earth, the solution could be to get rid of them. Problems and Solutions As early as 1917, Roy Scroggs conceived the first lifting body concept in the form of a delta-wing planform with a bulky fuselage. He then used his first patent to build the aircraft over a decade later. The concept was revisited in the aerospace era as a possible solution for spacecraft to smoothly re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. Moreover, it made it possible to land spacecraft in a conventional horizontal manner like regular aircraft. Traditional capsules, such as the one from the Mercury program, presented significant challenges after re-entering, most notably the inability to accurately control the landing. In contrast, a steerable craft with wings could help improve its trajectory. However, adding wings brought another problem, as the frail structure would have to endure the dynamic and thermal stresses of both re-entry and hypersonic flight. As such, the engineers proposed an unorthodox solution, to eliminate the wings altogether. The ambitious approach called for a creative bid, one that would attempt to design a fuselage body able to produce lift without wings and therefore make the extreme heat less damaging to the vehicle. Moreover, a lifting body can be considered a fixed-wing aircraft or spacecraft configuration, albeit with no conventional wing. Unlike a flying wing, which maximizes cruise efficiency at subsonic speeds, a lifting body tends to minimize the drag and structure of the wing for either subsonic or supersonic flight, or even hypersonic flight, all of which pose safety challenges. Still, when it came to spacecraft re-entry research and development, lifting bodies appeared to be a neat solution. Wright's Bicycle Shop Conceived as an alternative to a capsule spacecraft that returned to Earth dangling under a parachute, a lifting body would instead use the airflow over its fuselage to generate lift and land on a runway like a conventional airplane. Historian Curtis Peebles of the NASA Dryden Flight Research Center wrote, quote, The conclusion of the space shuttle program brought to a close an era that opened in the high desert of Southern California almost a half century earlier. The idea to delve into the lifting body concept initially emerged in the mid-1950s at the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics Ames Aeronautical Laboratory in Mountain View, California. Still, NASA did not begin refining the notion until 1962. The mere thought of an aircraft without wings was met with skepticism among engineers, at least at first. One notable exception was Robert Dale Reed of the then NASA Flight Research Center, now Dryden's. Excited as he was, the engineer began testing a series of small balsa wood and tissue paper lifting bodies, flying them down the main office building's hallways and off its roof. He eventually succeeded in raising interest in the concept. By February, Reed had developed a variety of shapes and was determined to gain support for a research vehicle. Not long after, Dryden Flight Research Center director Paul Bickle approved discretionary funding to build a home-built test model, and noted sailplane builder Gus Briegleb committed to helping make the extraordinary fuselage while located a mere 40 miles away. In turn, the internal framework would be built in a curtained-off section of a hangar at NASA. The secretive location was known as Wright's Bicycle Shop. The Flying Bathtub The designated M2F1 test vehicle was a joint venture between Dryden and the Brightweb Glider Company. The M stood for manned, while the F stood for flight. The construction began with a budget of $30,000 and the invaluable help of volunteers from the center to keep it tight. NASA engineers and craftsmen built a tubular steel frame for the interior, while Gus Briegleb and company made the mahogany plywood shell by hand. The NASA facility hosted the final assembly stage, adding the remaining components, namely the aluminum tail surfaces, pushrod controls, and landing gear taken from a Cessna 150. Interestingly, 
The aircraft would not become famous for being the world's first manned lifting body, but for its comical appearance. As Peebles put it, the M2F1, quote, looked like a bathtub sitting on a tricycle. Nevertheless, the lightweight, unpowered prototype would be enough to test the wingless concept, especially the landing part. Hot Rod Unlike a command module, which used a ballistic trajectory to re-enter the Earth and was thus limited in maneuvering range, the unwinged fuselage had a landing footprint the size of the entire state. Still, given that the craft was unpowered, the early tests were at the end of a tow rope. The first car tow attempts occurred on March 1st, 1963, at Rogers Dry Lake, with the tiny vehicle bouncing uncontrollably between the main landing legs and threatening to roll on its back should the pilot dare take it airborne. While the lifting body never surpassed a top speed of 86 miles per hour, it would not stop bumping until pilot Milt Thompson lowered the nose back to the ground. Given the poor results, the M2F1 was taken to the Ames Research Center for further wind tunnel testing. While analyzing footage from the tests, the researchers determined that the phenomenon was most likely caused by unwanted rubber movements. The problem was solved by modifying the control system, which changed the elevator control to the joystick. Still, another significant issue did not take long to arise. The Pontiac Bonneville that would pull the model soon proved to be underpowered and utterly incapable of lifting the M2F1 off the ground. Thus, the developers arranged to have the tow car hot-rodded. With a few modifications at two race shops, the car could now reach 110 miles per hour while towing the bathtub. Enhancements included tuning the engine for increased power, an added roll bar, and turning the passenger seat to face the rear, thus allowing one to observe the aircraft. Finally, on April 5, 1963, Thompson was able to lift the bathtub's nose for the first time. In fact, he was not only able to lift the M2F1, but also to remain airborne for considerable intervals. The aircraft would climb to about 20 feet, and after releasing the line, glide for about 20 seconds. There was not much else to be expected from a towing exercise. However, after several flights, Thompson eventually managed to keep the aircraft aloft for the entire four-mile run, producing enough flight data to proceed to the next phase. Through the spring and summer months, the pilot conquered even higher speed and altitudes until it was time to try free flight. The Descent As Curtis Peebles put it, a new era began the day, quote, the first of a series of low, lift-over-drag, wingless lifting bodies made its first free flight. And indeed, the M2F1 was an unlikely forerunner to the shuttle. It was August 16, 1963, when the aircraft made its first free flight, towed by a Navy C-47 to an altitude of 5,200 feet. Appropriately, the vehicle received an ejection seat and small, instant LD rockets in the tail to extend its landing flare for five seconds, if necessary. With his visibility hampered by the C-47, Thompson took the lifting body 20 feet higher than the aircraft. He then released the tow line and began a steep descent at a rate of 4,000 feet per minute. The flight was over in under two minutes, and both the pilot and the machine did well. Later tests began at 12,000 feet and reached speeds of about 120 miles per hour. But at 1,000 feet from the ground, the pilot would lower the nose to speed up to 150 miles per hour. Then, at 200 feet, the pilot set up the flare at an angle of 20 degrees for a smooth landing. The M2F1 sent the lifting body program to a successful start. By the time it retired three years later, the prototype had made 77 air-towed and about 400 car-towed flights. After having proven the concept, the heavyweight lifting body phase began. The researchers focused on metal designs from then on, giving birth to the Northrop M2F2 and HL-10 models and the Air Force's X-24 program, not to mention how profoundly the endeavor influenced the space shuttle development. When the first lifting body was retired, the M2F2 was already in the flight testing phase, launched by the NB-52 mothership. Similar to its predecessor in both design and flight characteristics in its unpowered phase, the M2F2 gave way to the M2F3, setting the stage for the construction of space shuttles. The successful M2F1 was restored many decades later in the mid-1990s. It was then returned to NASA Dryden towards the end of the century, where it remains to this day. 
for all their influence and effectiveness. Lifting bodies were found insufficient at low air speeds, and thus never entered mainstream aeronautical design, sending the otherwise outstanding innovation to the annals of the past. Thank you for watching our video. Don't hesitate to subscribe to Dark Skies for more stories about historical developments in aviation. And check out all our Dark Documentaries channels, where we publish regularly. Also, make sure to hit the thumbs up button, and don't miss out on our upcoming videos. Stay tuned.